Friday the 13th is the classic slasher film about counselors being murdered. Damn it, Jerry! I told you to stop the title three feet before the glass. Three feet, Jerry! I even marked the damn position for you. Well, we have to use it now, Jerry. That was the only pane of glass we had. We had one take to get this right. God. Friday the 13th begins at Camp Crystal Lake, 1958. Two of the counselors slip away to have sex because nothing drops panties faster than light Christian folk songs. The killer makes quick work of the male counselor, and the poor female counselor just looks like she's posting up down in the paint ready to snag some rebounds. Damn it, Karen, post up! Clear out, Karen, I'm gonna drive to the hoop. What the hell are you throwing boxes at me for? Karen, get out of the way! We then flash forward to present day where Annie is hitchhiking to her summer job as a counselor at Camp Crystal Lake. She meets a crotchety old man who agrees to give her a ride, and she also meets Crazy Ralph, who tells her that she's going to die at Camp Crystal Lake. You'll never come back again. It's got a death curse. <laughs> I smell a sitcom. It would kind of be a cross between Three's Company and The Odd Couple, except both guys are Oscar and Annie's just an idiot. If I were Annie, I wouldn't be as concerned about the weird guy telling me I'm going to die as I would be by the complete stranger that just hoisted me into his vehicle by my butt. He tells her to quit because of all the things that happened at Camp Crystal Lake. But honestly, his version of events don't sound that bad, especially over the course of 20 years. I mean, I guess it sounds bad, but it's not that bad. I mean, just think of how many kids die every year at a regular camp. Jack, Marcy, and Ned then arrive at camp and meet Steve Christie, the man who spent the last year trying to get Camp Crystal Lake back up and running again. After that bad water incident of 62, he's got a definite uphill battle on his hands. He also has to deal with ladies swarming him all the time. Back sometime after lunch. Just to rain like hell, so get as much done as possible. I don't want to get too far behind. Steve leaves teenagers in charge? You just met these kids and you're going to leave them unsupervised around your million dollar investment? I wouldn't trust teenagers to take care of a house plant. Irresponsible little monsters. Good for nothing is what they are. What's that? My house does get egged a lot. How did you know? So we know that the killer's already there because the director uses the same point of view of the killer camera shot that was also used in the movie Halloween. It can make for a very effective shot because you're seeing things through the eyes of the killer, but you also have to keep in mind what the other characters can or should see. You know that thing of when you're doing something you're not supposed to and someone walks in and you know that you're caught but all you can do is just stand perfectly still and hope they don't see you? Yeah, she totally should have seen him. Oh my god, Andy still hasn't made it to camp yet? I guess that's what happens when you hitchhike like 500 miles to your summer job. Hey, wasn't that the road up for Camp Crystal Lake back there? When she realizes the driver is going to take her to camp, she jumps out of the moving vehicle and gets chased down and murdered immediately. It's kind of a shame since she's the only counselor that had anything close to a backstory and character development. Back at camp, everyone's trying to work while Ned is just being a complete dickhole. I understand that he's supposed to be the funny, light-hearted aspect of this movie about violent murders, but I cannot wait for him to be violently murdered. Oh, oh. Something's wrong with Ned. Oh, God. Come on, Ned. Oh, dude. He pretended to drown so he could sexually assault Brenda? Hilarious. Looking for somebody. A guy named Ralph. Town crazy. Uh, this guy, Ralph, is he dangerous? After a thorough and lengthy two-minute investigation, the cop just leaves. Well, I really put the fear of God into them. <laughs> They'll think twice before that. Whoop, that's the leak. Just gotta turn it around here. Act like nothing happened. They are so afraid of me. Ned even acts like a goon when he's alone. 
It's starting to get dark and a storm is coming when Ned sees a figure moving in one of the cabins and goes to investigate. Then along come Jack and Marcy who proceed to have sex in one of the bottom bunks of the cabin. Unbeknownst to them, Ned is on the top bunk dead by means of a knife to the throat. And how dare the filmmakers not give us the satisfaction of seeing his brutal murder. The scene has always struck me as odd. Ned goes into this cabin and is brutally murdered, off camera. Jack and Marcy come in and make out for about two minutes before they start to go at it. Now let's assume that Jack is a competent lover, then you can add another 45 seconds to a minute. Tack on four minutes of cuddling time before Marcy leaves to go pee. Jack then lays by himself for another couple of minutes until he gets an arrow plunge through the bed and into his windpipe. So you're looking at around 10 minutes minimum that the killer was just laying under the bed while these two went at it? Pfft, pervert. Also, he could have killed both Jack and Marcy all at once, but now the killer has to walk all the way to the bathroom in the pouring rain in order to give Marcy the old axe to the face, if you know what I mean. She gets chopped in the face with an axe. If you're wondering how Strip Monopoly works, don't bother because the rules are frivolous and arbitrary. Brenda leaves to go close the windows in her cabin. I feel sorry for anyone stranded in the woods at night, but you will have to wait until daytime before I go to rescue you. You shouldn't have been out there that late. Bill and Alice decide to go look for Brenda because they thought that they heard her scream. At Brenda's cabin, they find a bloody axe, and upon realizing that they haven't seen any of their friends in a few hours, they completely lose their shit. Calm down, woman! And the murders come pretty fast at this point. Brenda and Bill are murdered off camera, and Steve gets killed as soon as he steps foot back into camp. Alice finds Bill's mutilated body hanging from a door, and finally, finally, I think Alice is ready to start acting like something is wrong. Alice then proceeds to barricade herself into the cabin, and unfortunately for her, Home Alone won't be released for another ten years to give her ideas on how to defend a house because she is bad at it. I don't know about you, but I don't have the heart to tell her that door opens towards the outside. Alice sees a jeep pull up and runs out to it only to find Mrs. Voorhees, who is an old family friend of Steve Christie. Well, I'm glad this kindly old woman showed up, so now everything will be fine. Did you know that a young boy drowned the year before those two others were killed? The counselors weren't paying any attention. They were making love while that young boy drowned. You never paid any attention. <laughs> Look what you did to him. Oh dear, she's a crazy person. So we learned that Mrs. Voorhees had a son named... Jeff? His name's not really important and I'm sure it'll never come up again. It's the anniversary of his death and Mrs. Voorhees is getting revenge the only way this walking tank of a woman knows how. Through slightly implausible murders. So we are then treated to the least sexy cat fight in the history of cinema. Seeing Mrs. Voorhees fight really makes all the other murders seem very avoidable for her victims. And finally, Alice manages to chop off Mrs. Voorhees' head and then just takes a boat into the middle of the lake, where she drifts until the morning. Oh, then the police show up and the movie ends with a pretty coherent ending with some real finality and absolutely no setup for a sake of... Oh. What was that all about?